All right, tonight I want to focus on verse number 9 in Matthew chapter number 23. The Bible reads, And call no man your father upon the earth, for one is your father which is in heaven. The title of the sermon is Call No Man Your Father. Call no man your father. Now I'm going to be preaching against the unscriptural and unholy teachings of the Catholic Church. Excuse me. The Catholic Church. And in particular, I'm going to be preaching against their, their ecclesiastical church structure. You know, their, their, their church structure, their authority structure that they have in the church of lifting up men to, to the point of exalting them, almost to the point of godhood. Now, here in, in uh, Matthew chapter number 23, verse number 9, we have a very clear, plain statement where Jesus Christ says in verse number 9, Call no man your father upon the earth. Call no man your father upon the earth. There is no way to misconstrue that statement. There's no way to misunderstand that statement. Call no man your father upon the earth. Now, in the Catholic Church, they have a hierarchical type of system. And at the very top of that system is who? What's his, what, what is his title? Pope. The Pope. Does anyone know what Pope means? Father. It means Father. It's actually a Latin word that actually means Father. So at the very top of the Catholic system, they have a man. Is he God? No. no. They have a man that they refer to as Father. That they refer to as Pope. But it doesn't even end there. You know, the diocese, I believe is what it's called, is your local Catholic church. Those are the, you know, the supreme leader is the Pope. But there are men that are under the Pope, the Father, like they call him, right? He's not my father, that's for sure. Right. But they, they have the local Catholic churches that look to an answer to the Vatican. They look to the Pope, right? But they themselves are also even referred to as father. And they can be called priests. Sometimes they will even refer to themselves as pastors. Most of the time, you know, especially those that are Protestants or, you know, Baptists, like we are, we're neither. You know, we're neither Catholic nor Protestant. Baptists, we're, we're, we're not protesting. We were never a part of the, of the unholy Catholic Church. Baptists weren't. Amen. You know, there were always Bible believers that were outside of the Catholic Church all along. Right. But... <clears throat> So, at the very top of the system, they have a man that calls himself father. But not only that, in the local churches, in the local Catholic churches, they, if you go there, you'll notice that they refer to the man's father. I've been out to eat before, and there'll just be a priest there, and maybe somebody that attends his church, or maybe somebody that's just Catholic. I've heard it numerous times. And they'll walk by this man, who is just as much a man as you are, just as much as, as a man as I am, and they'll walk by this man... You know what they'll say? Good day, Father. What did Jesus say? That is blasphemy. Amen. Amen. Just defying the word of God. And when people hear this kind of preaching, don't cringe. Did you listen? I don't have to go very far you know, to, to, to prove to you this morning that Jesus Christ preached hard against evildoers. Amen. Were you listening to Matthew chapter number 23? That's Jesus speaking. Right. You hypocrites. You generation of vipers. Talking about how they're unclean as, as, as the sepulchers, as like, you know, dirty, rotten bones on the inside. These, you know, when something is wicked and when something is evil, it needs to be pointed out so that people can be right. more. And that's why Christ was doing that. There's many people standing around that are fooled by these deceivers, these men. And you know what? When they hear Jesus pointing this out, then they realize and they understand and they know, I should stay away from them. Right. Well, I want you to stay away from Catholic churches. I want you to stay away from these men that put themselves in a spiritual position and they call themselves by, by the name Father when Jesus said, call no man your father upon the earth. Right, right, right. They are not your father. There's one, one that is your father. Yeah. And he is in heaven. I want you to turn to your, in your Bible. I want you to go to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. Turn in your Bible to 1 Timothy chapter number 3. And I'm going to explain to you how... <coughs> The Catholic Church is not based upon the Bible in, in any way. They claim that that is one of their authorities, you know, one of their authorities. They don't even say that it's their, that it is their sole authority. They'll plainly tell you that. They claim that it is one of their authorities. But I'm going to show you that it actually, that their teachings, when it comes to the authority structure of the church, when it comes to their priests, when it comes to their pope, 
that it actually defies the Word of God. It actually contradicts the Word of God over and over and over again. So here in 1 Timothy chapter number 3, we have in this chapter what a bishop or what a pastor is supposed to do in order to be qualified to be a pastor. If you want to be a pastor, these are the qualifications for being a pastor. I want you to look at verse number one. This is a true saying. If a man desire the office of a bishop, that's just another name for a pastor, he desireth a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, vigilant, sober, of good behavior, given to, given to hospitality, at to teach. Now, if you would have noticed there at the very beginning of verse number two, it said this. A bishop then must be blameless. Now, listen, the husband of one wife. Do you know what a requirement in order to be a pastor is? That you must have, you must have a wife. And, you, and you're only allowed to have one wife. But you at least must have a wife. You have to have a wife. You have to have a wife in order to be a pastor of a church, of a Bible believing, of a Christian church, right? Now, did you know that the Catholic Church actually teaches the opposite? In order to be the Pope, in order to be the priest, in order to be the local pastor, you are not allowed to have a wife. That is the exact opposite of what the Bible teaches. The Bible says if a man wants to be a bishop, he must be the husband of one wife. So we don't have to go very far to start seeing problems in the, in, the, you know, in the elements or the requirements of what they say as far as what you have to be a pastor of their church. That's because their church is not a biblical church. Right. It's not, you know why they don't have the same requirements and qualifications? Because it's not based on the Bible at all. It's not a Bible-believing church. That's why. They have their own qualifications because they have their own religion. Because it's not Christianity. Amen. A lot of times, even when you're speaking to Catholics, they'll even tell you, you'll ask them at the door, we go solely all the time, you'll knock on their door, and if you, and if you use this type of introduction, I've heard it multiple times, you're a Christian, what will they say? No, I'm, I'm, no, I'm a Catholic. Right. I've heard that tons of times. You know why? Because they understand they're different. Yeah. They understand we don't have the same roots. Mm. We're different, we're not the same. If you, you ever walked into or been in a Catholic church, maybe for a wedding or anything like that, it's not the same as a Bible-believing church. Right. At all. Not the same. The, 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 they're, they're men of God. They operate. They act. They're totally different. We're totally different. You know why? Because it's not Christianity. Right. It's not based upon the Bible. It's right. really not. And you know how we figure that out? We just go to the Bible. People, people, you know, say it's so confusing. There's all, you know, they say this, you say that. Well, let's, hey, let's figure out who's right. Amen. Let's figure out who's right. right. How clear is it? It says, very, a bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Number one, the husband of one wife. Where, Matthew chapter number 23, verse number nine. Call no man your father upon the earth. Both of those statements... Are, the, the Catholic Church is, def, is clearly just defying, yeah. totally contradicting with their authority structure. So one of the things that they claim is that Peter was the first pope, that Peter was their first pastor or their pope, and they say that they can trace this back to the church in Rome. And they also say that Peter... I'm talking about Peter, who, who was one of the 12 disciples. They say, Peter, that he was the one that passed down this tradition to the Roman Catholic Church of the authority structure, of not being married and everything that a pastor is supposed to do. Now, let's just say, if the Bible says that a bishop must be married, must be the husband of one wife, and Peter was a bishop and wasn't married, then he's still wrong. Let's just say that. But I'm going to show you and prove to you right now two things. Number one, I'm going to prove to you without a shadow of a doubt from the Bible that Peter was married. And number two, I'm going to prove to you from the Bible that there is no reason to believe that Peter was ever in Rome. Ever in Rome. Now, at first, I want to prove to you that he was married. Go to Matthew chapter number 8, verse number 14. Matthew chapter number 8, verse number 14. <clears throat> A lot of the deception that comes forth from these religions, these false religions, people claiming to be a Christian, they're claiming, you know, that they that their religion is based upon the Bible, it's very easily cleared up from clear statements in the Bible. 
You know, if someone is trying to deceive you, you know, about something that the Bible teaches, a lot of times you can just clearly find the Scripture. Because God's not the author of confusion. The Bible's very easy to understand. Look at Matthew chapter number 8. I want you to look at verse number 14. <clears throat> Matthew chapter number 8, verse number 14 reads, And when Jesus was come in to Peter's, into Peter's house, watch this, he saw his wife's mother laid and sick. Of a fever. Now, how clear is that? How clear is that? When he comes into Peter's house, it says that Jesus saw Peter's wife's mother laid sick of a fever. Can that be any clearer? So let me. It, let's just say, if if the Roman Catholic Church has always had this qualification that you're not allowed to be married, well, that right there, you're debunking your own theory that Peter was your own pope. Because Peter was for sure married, 100%. Now I want you to go to, I'm going to look at this one more time, to disprove this from another person actually in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, another angle, we'll see this disproved again. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, this is Paul writing. 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, verse number 5. This is Paul writing, he says in verse number 5, Have we not power... To lead about a sister, a wife. So he's saying, don't we have power to get married? Power to lead about a sister, a wife. And watch what he says, as well as other apostles. So he's telling you that other apostles, they lead about. They have a wife, right? He's, as, as other apostles. Now watch what he says. And as the brethren of the Lord. Now watch this. And Cephas. Anybody know who Cephas is? Peter. Peter. It's another name for Peter. And I could show that to you multiple different times where he's referred to as Cephas. We're actually going to go to one passage here in a moment where he's referred to as. So that's two different passages in the Bible where it clearly says that Peter was married. That Peter was married. Do you see how blatantly deceptive the Catholic Church is? Call no man your father upon the earth. Call no man your father. And then the Catholic Church shows up and says, hey, I'm the Pope. Call me Pope. The priests, the pastors of their church, when, when you come in, they set forth and ordain that their title is what? How blasphemous! Right. You should call me father. Can you imagine, Brother Hall? Call me father. <laughs> I, that's uncomfortable for me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how does this guy walk around? I mean, you have to be just this, just this arrogant weirdo. Yeah. Just walking around. <laughs> I'm father. <laughs> it's weird. Yeah. It's strange. The Catholic Church is blasphemous. It's nowhere near Christianity. It's right. not even close to Christianity. Right. Amen. Now, I'm not even going to touch on the most important issue is that they teach a false gospel. They are damning souls to hell. Right. They teach that you get to heaven by being a good person. When the Bible is just abundantly clear again, just as clear, just as clear you know, as I just debunked Peter not being married, showing you that he was married, the Bible teaches that salvation is a free gift. You do nothing for it, but just put your trust in Jesus. Amen. Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Right. Without. They have nothing to do with it. Faith without. They're not there at all. They have nothing to do with it without the deeds of the law. You are saved by grace through faith only. Nothing else. Amen. I want you to turn to, to uh, Romans chapter number 16. So first right there we can already see you're not supposed to call a man father. Therefore you should not be referring to a man as pope. You should not be calling priest father, pastors. Any spiritual leader should never be called father. They say that, that their pastors... I'm having withdrawals from the yerba mate. If people say I'm addicted to math, if I'm addicted to anything, it's a yerba mate. <laughs> Romans chapter number 16 here is, I'm going to have to ban those from the building. <laughs> I haven't had one in like two months. You know, I have a serious addiction to caffeine. I need to work that out. Romans chapter number 16 is the longest, is the longest uh, salutation, list of salutations in the Bible. Salutations are greetings. But it is a specific type of greeting most of the time. It's a greeting that, that is in closing. It's, you know, you are telling someone goodbye. So, <clears throat> Romans chapter number 16 is the longest list of salutations in the entire Bible. It is Paul writing to the church at Rome. He's writing to the church at Rome. And I, I want to point out something to you that's very interesting. There's someone that is never mentioned, and we're not going to read through here. 
You can read it later if you don't believe me, but there's one person that's not mentioned at all. Not one time. Do you know who it is? Peter. Peter. Now, can you, can, could you imagine someone writing a letter to Valiant Baptist Church? And I'm the pastor of the church. They, and they acknowledge every person in the church, but they don't even mention my name. Can you imagine that? They write a letter, you know, Dear Valiant Baptist Church. And then they're like, salute the Rays, salute the Bops, salute the, you know, the other Bops, salute the Martinez, like everybody. And then they just don't say, and they're like, salute Jessica Baker. And then they just don't mention my name. And all of her kids, right? And then they just don't mention my name. Does that sound believable? No. Do you know what's much more believable? Peter was never in Rome. Peter was never in Rome. And you know what? This, the book of Acts actually, you know, it, it records Peter. And the last time that Peter is seen, the very last time, do you know where he is? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. I can prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that Peter never left Jerusalem. You know why? If you go to John chapter number 21, when Jesus is speaking to Peter, his last time that he, he speaks to him personally that's recorded, he tells him that he is going to die the death of martyrdom. He's going to be martyred. And do you know what else Jesus said? That it's not, profit, it's not possible that a prophet dies outside of Jerusalem. The last time Peter is seen, he's in Jerusalem. Last time he writes a letter, talks to anyone, he's in Jerusalem, and Jesus Christ told him, in other words, you're going to die in Jerusalem. Because we can put the two statements together and there's no way around it. Jesus says no prophet can die outside of Jerusalem, and, and, and that's speaking of being a martyr, and then he tells Peter, you're going to be martyred. What's the conclusion? The only conclusion, you're going to die in Jerusalem. He never left Jerusalem. He was not the pastor of the church at Rome. That is not what the Bible teaches at all. I want you to go to Acts chapter number 10. Acts chapter number 10. If you wanted to Google pictures of people you know, uh, um, greeting the Pope, do you know what type of greeting they often will give this man? They'll, they'll kiss his hand. They'll bow down at his feet. They will literally, there are scores and scores of pictures of men and women bowing down before a man, calling him father and bowing down at his feet. I'm not going to do this either because I don't want to spend all night just you know, refining details, but the definition of worship is bowing down to someone in the Bible. That's, that's making obeisance. That is a form of worship when you bow down to someone. And people go and they bow down before this man and they call him father. You, they, you know, it's not a coincidence that Jesus explains, call no man your father, for one is your father which is in heaven. So who is the father? God. Amen. Who is God is the one that we should only worship, right? So wouldn't it make sense if this false religion is going to call this man father that they would also worship him? Wouldn't that make sense? As what? As God. If it's only a title for God, what are they, in other words, saying? That he's God, aren't they? Call no man your father. You know, and that's actually, you know, he calls himself the Pope throughout years, though he will call himself the vicar of Christ, right? Have you heard that before? The vicar of Christ. Is everyone familiar with what the word vicar means? Does everyone know what that word actually means? Have you ever heard anyone say this? Uh, you know, I've heard this a lot where someone would say, like, he's trying to live vicariously to his children. You've heard that before? Vicariously? It's just a, it's a noun. It's a longer word, a vicar, right? You know, so when someone is living vicariously through someone, they're trying to live in the stead of that person or in the place of that person. Like, if somebody doesn't make it in basketball, I've heard this a million times, I play a lot of basketball. Like, they don't make it, and they were good, and they went to college or something, and they don't make it, but then that... They have a child, and then, like, just from, you know, once the child's weaned, they're just, like, constantly training this kid. And then we'll talk about, like, he's just trying to live vicariously. He never made it, so he's trying to live vicariously through his son. I've heard that many, many times. Just try, he's trying to live in the places. He, didn't, he never made it to the NBA or wherever, so he wants his child to make it kind of like it's him. That'll be his way of making it, right? So I want you to think about that. In the stead of is basically what vicar or vicariously means. So this man says that he is in the place or in the stead of Christ. Yeah. How blasphemous is that? Right, right. It's disgusting. It's horrible. Amen. Amen. Don't mince words. I mean, that is terrible. He's saying that I am worthy to stand in the very place of, that, of Christ. 
I'm filling the shoes of him. Think about that. I'm doing what he did. It's horrible. Look at Acts chapter number 10, verse number 25. And as Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshipped him. Now notice what the definition of worship is. What is it? What is he doing when he's worshipping him? Falling down at his feet. Therefore, definition of worship or, or would be bowing down. So notice, he falls down at his feet and he worships him. Now watch what Peter does. But Peter took him up saying, stand up. I myself also am a man. I myself also am a man. What is he saying? Don't worship, me. Don't worship me. I'm not any better than you. I'm a man just like you are. Right. You know what these people do to the Pope? They come and they fall down at the Pope's feet. And they call him Father. And they'll worship him. And, and the Pope today claims... I am, you know, I'm just in a line of pastors that goes all the way back to Peter. I'm just doing the same job that Peter did. Mm. Then why are you allowing men to come worship you and Peter never would have done that? Right. Why are you allowing a man to come and bow down and you're just receiving this worship? That's horrible. Yeah. You're just standing there and allowing another man that you are no better than to just come and bow down at your feet and, you just, and you're allowing them to just worship you. I mean, it's, it, it, I don't know if you understand how disgusting this is, but just imagine a person, a human being, coming and bowing down at your feet and, sincere, and sincerely in their heart worshiping you. How, how wrong would that feel to you? So how wrong does your heart have to be to receive that worship and to think that you're worthy of that? What, what pride to think, yes, I should have the title of Father. Call me Father. I'm worthy of it. I am able and worthy to stand in the place of Christ, in the shoes of Christ. Call me the vicar of Christ. Call me Pope and worship me. It's horrible. It's terrible. Amen. The Catholic Church is so far from Christianity, it's not even funny. Right. They are way out in left field. Amen. They're not even in the same field. It's terrible. Do We need to really understand how different the Catholic Church is. I want you to go to Matthew chapter number 16. This is another passage. This is actually a passage that they will use. You'll hear them often use this. They misunderstand this. I'm going to explain it to you. But they'll use this to say that the church was built. The Catholic church was built upon Peter. The Catholic church was built upon Peter. <clears throat> they misunderstand this passage here. Matthew chapter number 16. I want you to look, we'll begin reading in verse number 13. The Bible says, When Jesus came into the coasts of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, saying, Whom do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, Some say that thou art John the Baptist, some Elias, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, But whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. Look at verse 18. <coughs> and I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Verse 19. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then charged he his disciples that, that, that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. Now here in verses 17 and 18 is where the disagreement and their misunderstanding comes in. I want you to keep your hand here. I want you to flip over to Mark chapter number 8. If you compare this parallel passage, you'll notice that there's a portion of the passage deleted. If you look at Mark chapter number 8. The Gospels will record in different parts of different statements. Some will be missing certain statements. Some will have those statements. And we can learn things by comparing the two. Well, when you look at this exact passage in Mark chapter number 8, there are a couple of verses that are missing. So you can see what the overall point of the context is that's being given when you compare the passage. I want you to look in Mark chapter number 8. I want you to look at verse number 27. And Jesus went out and his disciples into the towns of Caesarea Philippi. And by the way, he asked his disciples, saying unto them, Whom do men say that I am? And they answered, John the Baptist, but some say Elias. The others, one of the prophets. <clears throat> and he saith unto them, Whom say ye that I am? 
And Peter answereth and saith unto them, Thou art the Christ. Now look at verse 30. And he charged them that they should tell no man of him. Do you notice that there's a certain part of that passage that's missing? Did you notice that? If you go back, it's verses 17 and 18. And it's not missing, it's not supposed to be there. I'm just saying that when you compare the text, the two parallel passages, there's a few verses that are taken out. So we can see by the overall context that it is talking specifically in that chapter, it's talking specifically about what? Christ. That's what the focus is on. That, that Jesus is the Christ. So it's about Jesus. That's what the focus of the passage is on. I want you to keep that in mind. When we go back to Matthew chapter number 16. Look at Matthew chapter number 16 there. So he asks him in verse number 14. Chapter 16 verse 14. He asks him. Some say that. Or he asks him in verse 13 actually. Whom do men say that I the son of man, man am? Verse 14. And they said some say that thou art John the Baptist. Some Elias and others Jeremiah. So these are Old Testament prophets. Elijah and Jeremiah. And then he says or one of the prophets. He saith unto them. But whom say ye that I am? Now watch this. So Simon Peter speaks up. And Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So Simon Peter responds to him and he says, I'm saying that thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. So he, of course, knew that he was the, the Messiah or the Savior to come, right? And he also knew he was the Son of God. Verse 17, And Jesus answered and said unto him, <coughs> Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee, but my Father, which is in heaven. The it there is referring back to him being the Christ. Michaela, give me some water, please. The it there is referring back to that Peter knew that he was the Christ, right? Well, look at verse 18. I say also unto thee. So notice the also. Like you said that, now I'm saying this. I say also unto thee, thou art Peter. Now, does that sound familiar? It's the same thing that, that it's the same statement, style of statement. That Peter said. He said, Thou art the Christ. We said, I say also unto thee, speaking to Peter now, Thou art Peter. But then he says this, And upon this rock I will build my church. Now, the Catholic Church believes that this rock is referring to Peter. Okay? Has anyone heard that before? That when it says, Upon this rock, that he's actually speaking about Peter. So he says, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, just real quick, I want to give you one, one thing, and we're going to look at something else, which is in relation to this passage, and then we're going to come back to it. But grammatically, would it make sense if he said, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this, would, he, would it make sense to say grammatically this, when he's speaking to him and he says thou, would that make sense grammatically? It would not. If he said... I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. Does that make grammatical sense? It does not. The this is referring back to the statement that he made. That's why I pointed out it. It was speaking about uh, flesh and blood hath not revealed it unto thee. And that was the truth that he was the Christ. So when he refers back to him, he says, I say also unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock... He's talking about the Christ himself is what he's talking about. And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now, the first step we're going to do is we're going to look and just see who's the rock in the Bible. Just repeatedly, who is spoken of as being the rock. There's something in the Bible called the law of first mention. The very first time that a word is used in the Bible, normally that word will be defined. The very first time that it's used, and it will carry that same meaning every time that it is used throughout the Bible. Well, the first time the word rock comes up in Deuteronomy chapter number 32, verse number 4, it says this. He is the rock. His work is perfect for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth, and without iniquity, just and right is he. Who's the he there? He is the rock. Who's it talking about? It's God. It tells you that it's not Peter. It's God. Right. Psalm chapter number 18, verse number 2, it says this. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my strength, and whom... I will trust my buckler and the horn of my salvation and my high tower. Psalm 1831, for who is God save the Lord? Or listen to this, or who is a rock save our God? Did you notice that? Who is a rock save or accept our God? Saying no one else is a rock but God. Right. 
So you know what that means? Peter's been eliminated as an option, just from that verse there. Who is the rock save our God? No one. Matthew chapter number 21, verse number 42, just a few passages after this. You don't need to turn there because we're going to stay where we're at. But Jesus tells you that he is the rock. Matthew 21, verse 42, Jesus saith unto them, Did you never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected? The same has become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Speaking about himself being the stone or being the rock, just a few chapters later, he tells people, I'm the rock. I'm the stone. <clears throat> so, and we could also, we could look at what, who, who Peter thinks the rock is. 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 6. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. You know what he's talking about? Jesus. So, so Peter himself, when he writes about who the rock is, he says it's Jesus. We look back at this passage in chapter number 18. It says this, that, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church. And then he says this, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's also an interesting statement. He says the gates of hell are not, gonna, are not going to you know, uh, prevail against the rock or against the church, right? Because the church is built upon the rock. Well, I want you to go to, keep your hand here, go to Revelation chapter number 1. Revelation chapter number 1. It said the gates of hell will not prevail against it. <clears throat> we saw that Christ is the rock. Well, look what it says in Revelation chapter number 1. Look at verse number 18. For I am he that liveth and was dead. This is Jesus speaking. And, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now notice that Jesus Christ says, I have the keys of hell and of death. Now if Jesus is the rock and he contains the keys of hell and of death, wouldn't it make perfect sense to say that the church would not, the gates of hell would not prevail against the church because it's built upon the rock, which is Jesus, and he has the, the keys of hell and of death? Wouldn't that make perfect sense? We go back again, look at verse number 18. It says, and I say also unto thee, we're going to read it again, that thou art Peter and upon this rock. The this there specifically is referring back to the statement of where he says, and Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Just like he refers back to that statement as it, a few minutes later, he refers to it as this, right after that, because the rock is the Lord Jesus Christ. Every time in the Bible, the rock is always Jesus. Every single time when you look it up. You know, and, and you know, Peter is not something that I would want my, my church to be built upon in the first place. When you keep reading this passage, I want you to look at verse number 21. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised again the third day. Then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. Watch verse 23. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto men, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. That's not a rock that I want my church built on right there. That's why the song, you know, that we'll sing, um, oh, it slipped my mind, I can't remember exactly how it goes. Um, my, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood, is that right? Jesus' blood and righteousness. How does it go about the shifting sand? Does anyone remember? If you look up the history of that song, it talks about how, you know, it's, where it's not built on shifting sand, right? If you look up the history of that song, it was actually written by a Protestant or a Baptist. And they were actually writing that in response to the Catholic Church. And, and it was talking about how, you know, how it's built upon a rock. It may not be that song. I may be wrong about it. Is that the right song? Rock of is it Rock of Ages? All other ground is sinking. All other ground is sinking sand. That's right. Yeah, yeah. I, I just had thought of that, and I had I should have looked it up first. Yeah, it's actually that song was actually written in response to the Catholic Church and saying that their church is built upon shifting the shifting sand of Peter, while you know the church that he attended, by being a Baptist or you know whatever he was at that time, just not the Catholic Church, was built upon a rock. That was the point, uh, one of the points behind the history and why that person wrote that. And it was based on the shifting sand of Peter. Because when you look at Peter throughout the Gospels, he had a close relationship with Jesus, but that guy had a lot, a lot of problems. And you know what he was? 
He was tossed to and fro constantly. His faith was just, uh, it was just a roller coaster nightmare. And that's what they say, this is our rock. And then like three verses later, he's like, get thee behind me, Satan. It's like, man, a lot. That's not a rock that I want my church built on. That's for sure. I'll stick with Jesus. You take man and you take Peter. I'll just stick with the cornerstone that the builders rejected. Isn't that kind of funny? You know? And when you look at Matthew chapter number 23, the very people that Jesus is talking about two chapters earlier is speaking to the Pharisees and the Jews who rejected the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the cornerstone that everything is built upon. It's those same type of people. When he describes in Matthew 23 the Pharisees, what do they do? Go in long robes. They love to be called, you know, master. They're calling themselves father. What's that sound like? Sounds like the Pope to me. Sounds like the Catholic Church to me. I want you to turn to Matthew chapter 2. Yeah, keep your hand here and just go over to Matthew 18. Another thing that they do here in verse number 19, they say, well, the Pope is Peter. And Peter has the keys that a man, they'll say, has the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Who do they say is waiting at the pearly gates? Peter, did you know that that comes from this verse? Did anyone know that? Because they say he has the keys. He's got to let you in. Did anybody ever thought of that? He's standing there. It's ridiculous. He's standing there, and you walk up to the gate, and he's standing there with the keys like, see this, buddy? It's like your destiny rests in his hand on those. Isn't that weird? And he's the one letting people in. Look at verse 19 in that chapter, where Matthew chapter number 16. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So he says, I'll give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven. They believe that that's like Peter's the one that makes the decision almost to let you in. And they think that this was something exclusive to Peter. That's what they said. They think that he had a position of preeminence above all the disciples and the apostles when it comes to this. But it just so happens they forgot to read Matthew chapter number 18, I guess. The word the in Matthew 16 is singular. So he is speaking specifically to Peter when he says that, right? Well, I want you to look at Matthew chapter number 18. I want you to look at verse number 15. Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee... Then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. Verse 17. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. Look at verse 18. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Does that sound familiar? It is literally a verbatim statement, but there's a, there's a little bit of a difference. Well, I don't know whether you caught it or not. <clears throat> Verse 18, it says again, Verily I say unto you. Now, in our common speech today, we do not do this, but at the time the King James Bible was translated, you and ye, those words and your, they're all plural. That is, that is a, uh, those are plural words. Those are plural pronouns that are used. Thee and thou, those words are all singular. So Matthew chapter number 16, he's speaking individually and specifically to Peter. But he's not only talking to Peter here in Matthew chapter number 18. He's talking to the church. Because if you look at the passage right before that, he says, whatsoever, or I'm sorry, and if, and if, he, and if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. But if he neglect to hear the church... Let, let him be unto, unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So notice, if he neglects to hear the church, he says, Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth. Talking to everyone that's a member of the church. Notice that. Whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall lo loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Again I say unto you that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything, that they shall ask. That they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father, which is in heaven. So, you can clearly, this is, it's so easy, it's, it's so easy, it's, it's, it's almost not even fun just to debunk their stupid arguments. So they go there and they're like, see, Peter has just this specific authority and power to let people into the kingdom of heaven. See? And then two chapters later, the same statement is told to the whole church. Isn't that ridiculous that they would just rip something out of context like that and try to make it teach that? Go to John chapter number 20. John chapter number 20. 
They teach because of that also that Peter has the ability and popes have the ability and priests have the ability to forgive sins. That they have the ability to, to actually you know, grant forgiveness unto man. I want you to look in verse number 21. Then, Jesus, then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. And then it says, verse 22, And when he had said this, he breathed on them, and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Verse 23, Whosoever sins ye remit, they are remitted unto them, and whosoever sins ye retain, they are retained. This is a passage that they will try to twist. This is not only speaking to Peter, though, is another major problem. They'll just quote this to you, and they'll try to... I've heard this like three or four times at the door from random Catholics. Where, so they're obviously being taught this. That this passage is a proof that, they, that, the, that Peter was able to just, you know, forgive like whoever sins he wanted to forgive in that sense. Right? But you know what I always do when someone turns, turns me to this? I always show them, well, let's look at the parallel passages the, the last time Jesus comes to them. And let's see how people re receive the forgiveness of sins. You just flip over to Matthew. Actually, let's go to Mark chapter 16 because that's clear. Mark chapter number 16. Let's see how they are able to, to receive forgiveness. Mark chapter number 16. Mark chapter number 16. Look at when he sends them forth because you, you saw that he was teach, speaking about sending them. Look at verse number 15. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Do you know how the apostles had the ability to forgive sins in a sense? Do you know how? Because they had the gospel. And then they were sent forth with the Holy Spirit to go preach the gospel. And the gospel is where you, you receive the remission of sins. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and see this again. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. This is not only a, 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 something that is given, an ability that is given to the apostles, it's given to every Christian, every saved Christian. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 5. It says in verse number 18, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. Now watch this. And hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation. Now, what does it mean, reconciliation? What does it mean to reconcile two things? It means to bring them back together. Saying that God gave to us the ministry or the work to be able to reconcile the relationship of man and God. How are we doing that? We take the gospel with us. We preach the gospel to someone. And then they have the ability, after hearing it, they have the choice of whether or not they're going to trust and believe the gospel, and then they receive the, the forgiveness of sins. Through the gospel, Amen. everyone has the ability of doing that. Christ, you know, Christ gave his 12 disciples a specific commission. He breathed on them, and he told them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And then he sent them forth, and they had the ability to forgive sins. Why? Because they have the gospel. Because the gospel has the ability to forgive sins. And they were given the ministry of reconciliation. Look at what it says next. To wit that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Notice the ministry of reconciliation is used in synonymous, uh, synonymously with the word of reconciliation. Because when you go forth to do the work, to, to, to reconcile someone, you're, you're taking the word with you. The ministry of reconciliation referring to the gospel, and it's the word. You have to have the word of God in order to be saved. It's nothing special that you have. It's no power that you have to forgive someone's sins. It's just the word of God that you have. You just take the gospel, and that right there is the power to forgive sins. It's nothing that you do yourself. There's nothing special about Peter that he's greater than any other man, and he can just decide in his own volition that he just wants to forgive a man. No. The only thing Peter had was the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and that enabled him to forgive sins. Amen. That is all that it was. He could not choose on him, by himself and say, hey, I want to forgive your sins and not yours. Wrong. He had the ministry of reconciliation, and that is it. You compare the passage 
mission, what is it? It's when he's sending forth his disciples to preach the gospel. Amen. Right there it says this in verse number 20. Now then we are ambassadors for Christ. As though, watch this. As though God did beseech you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Now notice that, that we're ambassadors for Christ. That, you know, so if you were to take like what the, the Catholic Church says, oh, you know, we're the vicar. He thinks he's literally the vicar of Christ. But we're not literally in Christ's stead. That's why it says, as though God did beseech you by us. So in what way is it saying that we're in Christ's stead? Because Christ died on the cross and then he sent you forth as his messenger, as his ambassador with a message saying, God wants you to be saved. I'm beseeching you in his stead. I'm coming here because he wanted me to come here. Because why? Because Jesus sent them forth into all the world. Does that make sense? He is the one, you know, on behalf of or in the stead of just coming to the door. You know, there's no pope on this planet that has ever lived. There's no priest on this planet, a part of the Catholic Church, that ever even preached the right gospel. There is never a Catholic Church a leader or, or just anyone a part of, the, of their authority structure that has ever even had the gospel to even go in Christ's stead. When have you ever heard of someone, you know, from a Catholic church going door to door actually preaching the true gospel? It's unheard of. It's never happened probably in the history, I'm sure, in the history of the Catholic church. So it's not just some special power that's given unto Peter. It's not just some special ability where Peter can just choose that he wants to forgive sins. That's not what it is at all. They were given the gospel is what they were given. And then they were sent forth with the Holy Ghost to go and preach the gospel. I want you to turn to 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 5. 1 Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 5. First Timothy chapter number 2, verse number 5. There is no man that is capable of being a mediator to God but the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the reason why he can mediate for us is because he is fully God and he is fully man. He can bridge that gap between God and between man because he is God and he is man. Right. That is the reason why. And you have these, these fools of priests who think that they can stand up and they can bridge that gap. These men that say, you know, I'm Father, I, I can be in Christ's stead. I can be the vicar. You know, I want you to look here at 1 Timothy chapter number 2. Notice what it says in verse number 5. For there is one God <coughs> and one mediator. <coughs> Excuse me. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. You notice that? One mediator. There's one God and one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. Only. There is no one else that is you know, eligible or qualified to fill that gap. If you look in this passage, it's very interesting. Go up to verse number 3. <coughs> For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior. So notice, God is the one that's referred to as the Savior here, right? Look at verse 4. Who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. It's talking about God still being the Savior, right? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So there's the distinction there for a moment made between God, right? And then the man Christ Jesus. We'll look at the very next verse, verse number six. <clears throat> Speaking of the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. What is he doing when he gives himself a ransom for all? He's the Savior, isn't he? But notice that it said that God was the Savior right up there because the mediator is the God-man. He is fully God. He is fully man. He is the only one that's, that's eligible to bridge that gap. No one can be a mediator for man. No one besides the Lord Jesus Christ. That is it. That is the only person that is qualified. They'll refer to Mary as a mediatrix. And they'll pray to Mary. They'll go to the priest and they'll confess their sins to this priest. There's no one that can be a It's so ridiculous. It's almost mind-boggling. He's a man just like... Yeah, who does he... You know, where does he go with all of his sins? He's probably got a lot more than you do in the first place. 
You look at all these scandals that the Catholic Church comes out with. They have all these stinking priests who are, you know, molesting little boys. Just disgusting filth. And what do you think would happen to a man's mind if he sits in a box and listens to disgusting talk all day? That's why no man can be your mediator. Because he's a sinner himself. So you take some guy, you put him in this dark room, and you let people just come and confess their deepest, darkest sins. What do you think is going to happen to that guy's mind? It's going to become corrupt because he cannot mediate. Because he has his own sins. He's a sinner himself. Right. Right. That's why these guys become a bunch of pedophiles and reprobates. Yeah. Because they, they, they are just as much a sinner as you are. That's why. Right. We need a mediator who is holy, harmless, separate from sinners. That's what we need. Amen. We need someone that's separate from sinners. A man can't mediate for you. There's one God and one mediator. It's the man Christ Jesus only. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter number 8, verse number 6. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. But how much more also he is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established upon better promises. Hebrews 9, 15. And for this cause he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 24. And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. He's the mediator of, of that covenant because it was his blood that established that covenant. No pope you know, ever died for you know, the sins of the world. They had their own sins. Same reason why they can't die for you is the same reason why they can't mediate for you. They need a mediator themselves. You know, I want you to turn, let's finish in uh, 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 1. This will be the last one. This actually proves that Peter himself had the same authority status as all other, other pastors. I believe that Peter was a pastor based upon this verse that we're about to read right now. An elder oftentimes in the Bible is referred to, uh, or oftentimes uh, pastors are referred to as the title of elder. Elder is used interchangeable as pastor and bishop. Look at 1 Peter chapter number 5. I want you to look at verse number 1. This will be the last thing that we look at. 1 Peter chapter number 5, verse number 1. It reads, The elders which are among you I exhort. And then he says this, Who am also an elder, and a witness of the suffering of Christ, sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Look at verse 2. Feed the flock of God which is among you. This is speaking to a pastor. Taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage. So notice he's talking to the rulers of the church, but being in samples to the flock. So when he says he's an elder, he's saying he's a ruler, he's a bishop, right? He Notice that he puts himself on the exact same level as those that he's writing to. Did you notice that? He says, the elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder. You know what he's saying? Just like you. What do they say? Oh, Peter was the first pope. And he was, he's the leader of all these other churches. That's not what Peter said. I'm an elder just like they're an elder. I want you to notice, and I want to end with verse number four. It says this. We'll read verse three again. Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. Verse four. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So notice who that supreme ruler over all the elders are. Hey, you're a shepherd over your church, you're a shepherd over your church, you're an elder at your church, I'm also an elder at my church. But you know who's above all of us? The chief shepherd. Do you know who that is? That's that one mediator. That's the Lord Jesus Christ. The only man that can be the mediator. Amen. The only man that can bridge that gap. The only man that can stand between God and man. That's the chief shepherd. That's the everlasting Father. Let's go ahead and have a word of prayer. Yeah. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, dear Lord, for everything that you did that we as mankind could never do. We thank you, dear Heavenly Father, for making the Bible so clear when there are false religions that we can identify them, Lord. We thank you, dear God, for loving us and for giving us the Bible. And we thank you for being that mediator and, uh, as I said, doing what we could never do, dear Lord, and, and bringing us back to yourself, reconciling us to yourself. Just be with us. Bless our church. And bless all those that were in attendance tonight. And help us, to, dear, dear Lord, to have the, the discernment that we require that's needed 
in order to live a good spiritual life and that we can be aware of those that would try to deceive us and do us wrong and, and teach us falsehoods. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.